Do it. Ready? Three, two, one. All right. Welcome, everybody, to Father's Voice, the podcast dedicated to empowering men to embody the multifaceted roles of father, husband, provider, and man of God. In each of these episodes, we dive into the essential qualities and principles that define true greatness in the in these roles, drawing inspiration from timeless wisdom of the Bible and personal experiences from many of our guests. And uh, so we're confident that you will like and share. So let's get started. We have today our, an amazing guest, one of my favorite people on earth, Rabbi Bryant. Brian Belichi. Brian Belichi. Obviously, he has his own podcast as well. Um, Dust to the Rabbi. Dust to the Rabbi. I've listened to many, many, many episodes. Um, he's a friend of both myself and Raul. Um, more than that, he's just a part of the reason, obviously, he's your great father. When we see how oh, you raise your daughter, you. the love you have for people, and fathering not even only in the sense of your own genetic daughter, but even so many other young men and young women, how you've just been like an open heart and a willing person to engage with so many different people. And so you're a blessing to me as a friend, as well as to Raul as a friend, Yes, but we admire you as a father. And so yeah. we, we honor you and we thank you for that. Obviously, you have a dual rule. So for those that don't know, um, he's pastor on Sundays and then um, rabbi on Shabbat or Saturdays. So you might say in the reverse order, but nonetheless, he's a rabbi and a pastor. So a messianic rabbi yes. in that he believes Jesus Christ. So it is an honor to have you here with us, Rabbi. We're pumped about today. It's an honor yes. to be here, guys. <laughs> and by the way, I have to say, you are great fathers yourselves. Hmm. Sometimes. <laughs> no, you are. You are great fathers. I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> I'll take it too. It's true. <laughs> a great father knows you how are to pastor. roll with the punches, right? Very yeah. true. Very true. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah. so we're gonna we're gonna start by you know getting to know you or our our. I mean, we know a lot about you already, but having our our listeners get to know you. So, so why don't we start there? Tell us so, a little bit about your. So or let me what, let me say yeah. a few things about Rabbi as well. One thing about Rabbi, he's good for a party, right? And I think about two Sundays ago we were at Maestro's, fantastic steakhouse. Yeah, it was like my first time there. But Rabbi is always a lot of fun. That was fun. It was a blast. He enjoys a good glass of wine, which I know. My wife loves wine, and she's not yet a connoisseur of wine, but I will say, um, Rabbi is a blast to take on a party. So if like you go somewhere, <laughs> his level of conversation, on and on, he is a oh yeah, he's a blast. And so, well, I'm trying to be like Jesus, absolutely. right? Because <laughs> hey, his mother even knew where to go when everybody ran out of wine at the wedding, right? So you got to know culturally in the Jewish world. It's not about drunkenness. It's no. about with a meal at a family gathering or with friends that was done very respectfully, mm -hmm. intentionally, mm -hmm. for a time to celebrate. Mm -hmm. But never as it's used in our world today, the idea of drunkenness is completely a sin in the Bible. Right. But the Jewish world used it as a symbol of joy. Mm -hmm. So it's always a joy for me to almost you know, help others with the tasting process because to me, wine tasting is more fun than actually just drinking wine because you mm -hmm. get to try different varietals. At the same time, you get to learn all those different S's, the swirl, the sniff, the smell, the sip, you know, there's yeah. all these different, and then there's the savor. And where so- did, Where did you get that? Um that uh that interest is it a jewish thing or well it is a jewish thing it's also an italian thing Correct. but i learned going to italy for my honeymoon me and my wife got married and and to clarify you're sicilian i mean I'm i know it's sicilian, italian just like my wife sicilian italian because some right. of our people lived in both sicily and italy right. but most of our family with the name Belecci, we're from Palermo, mm -hmm. which is the capital, and then Trapani, which mm -hmm. is just right there on the coast, right next to it. And so those two regions, um, that area was a Jewish quarters, mm -hmm. and Jews hid as Catholics, and there would be only a few identifiers to know that they were actually Sicilian Jews, not just regular uh, Sicilians. And so there was definitely, on the west side of the island and on the east side of the island, uh, Messina was also a Jewish quarters. And then, of course, throughout Italy, Rome and Calabria and different places, we have still remnants and villages and towns where there's Jewish bakeries, mm -hmm. and everyone knows this was the Jewish quarters. And I would say Sicilians and Italians in general are very given to wine. My wife's grandfather had a winery even up in uh, Ranch Cucamonga area. And so yeah. in that Grow community, the grapes. For sure. Yes. The whole process of it. Yes. And so that's part of your And background. that's actually what I loved about Italy is because the best table wine was is basically something they grew. Mm -hmm. There's nothing added. There's not all that, you know, the sulfites mm -hmm. and all this stuff. I would say our wines, especially if you like California wine, 
it's this syrupy, you know, mix of junk put in it, just like mm -hmm. most of our foods are processed. So anytime you get to do a tasting where the sommelier really and by the way, a sommelier organic, is an expert on wine. An expert on wine. A lot of people don't know that. I, yeah. I never knew that until recently. I, I didn't yes. know that till now. Sommeliers, yeah. That, yeah, and there's <laughs> levels to it. Uh, so so when they are trained on how to taste the wine, especially old world wines, you you get to appreciate something that it's the way God grew it. It's the way God intended it, not the way we make wine today to get people drunk. Mm. It was a lot simpler. It was easier on the palate. You didn't have to worry about a headache or a hangover, any of those things. Very simple. And that's when we fell in love, just like with a little bit of wine. Okay, with the meal, it's nice. And then as a Jew, keeping it for Shabbat, it is a symbol of joy for all of the Sabbath days and feast days. So even on the Orthodox side, on a wine. Shabbat, it's going to be wine, correct? 100%. Yeah. In all the Jewish world, wine is acceptable. Now, they do understand that some people have sensitivities in today's world, so you can do kosher grape juice as well as kosher wine. So it is an option. But in the biblical days, wine was wine. For sure. But it... For instance, we can make wines extra strong or with more alcohol in it. I would say it was probably a little bit less intoxicating. Yeah. You had to drink a long time you know, staring at the wine and drinking the wine, as the Bible says, to actually get intoxicated. Mm. And drunkenness was in the same category as gluttony. So overindulgence <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. of any yeah, good either thing, one, mm -hmm. for either sure. one, it yeah. can be a sin and an abuse to your own body as a temple. Absolutely. And definitely affect the community. And your family. So you want to always be mindful of that. Rabbi, I always wonder, how, how do you know so much detail and so much of it in many different subjects? That's I'll tell you, I'll tell fascinating. You what, I'll tell you what every test tells me, personality test and strength finder test, mm -hmm. is I'm a learner. And my number one skill, it's just like Pastor Obed is a vision caster. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. says, I'm good at three things, vision casting, vision casting, and vision casting. Mm -hmm. And it's true. My number one strength is that I'm always curious and I always want yeah. to learn. So I don't wait for people to teach me. I'm going to go out and find it. And I'm going to ask everyone I know that knows anything about the topic as well as use every book and resources I, uh, resource I can yeah. to discover it. And I think on Strength Finder, I remember seeing your results. And I think you're actually like he glows in line with what a professor is. So part of his thinking is that of a professor or teacher. I mean, he's, just, he's wired for that. Mm -hmm. And so the memory of history and all these other things that sort of wind together is the mindset of a, of a professor or a teacher. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. how you're wired. And, I, and I've always felt like when it comes to learning, I like to experience. I don't want just to only have book knowledge. So like, for instance, going to Israel, as you know, Pastor <laughs> Nate, it's like the whole Bible comes alive to you. For sure. So I believe experiential knowledge needs to go along with mm -hmm. intellectual, textual knowledge. Because if you only know about a topic, it's not the same as knowing it. It's like getting to know Pastor Nate or know you, Raul, is different from just knowing about you from what I read in an article. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we got to get beyond that in the in our faith is just thinking, well, I know about that. I know about this. Do you? Have you experienced it? And have you put it into practice? Yeah. yeah. Man, I could already tell this is going to be an amazing episode. Come on. For and sure. me personally, to be honest with this, it's an honor to just be in the same table talking about all these different things that we're going to talk about. I so feel the I'm, same honor. I'm honored. <laughs> it's going to be fun. Let's jump right in, and we'll start Let's first, Rabbi, it. with a little bit of your background, yep. and, and briefly, we don't expect a comprehensive, but yeah. your um, family situation as a child. Growing up, of course, I have parents that are from two different states as far as family origin. So my mom's from Mobile, Alabama. My dad's from New Orleans, Louisiana. He grew up in Baton Rouge, though, most of his life. And on my dad's side, I'm Italian, French, Austrian, German, Jewish, and my mother, I'm black, American, Indian, Irish, and Jewish. So I have Jewish blood on both sides, but I would say most of the European Jews came from my dad's side, from Europe through mm -hmm. Sicily, not to Ellis Island, but to New Orleans, another oh, wow. port mm -hmm. that Jews and immigrants would come through. You know, that whole Louisiana mm -hmm. Purchase, you know, a lot of French and Italians, you know, they lived in in Louisiana. So for me growing up, knowing that first of all, I'm pretty ethnically diverse. And by the way, I didn't know I was Jewish growing up. I just was attracted to all things Jewish. When mm -hmm. I'd read my Bible, or I'd read history, it always made me want to put my encyclopedias and dictionaries alongside my Bible. And then I went out and bought the Vines Dictionary and the Strong's Concordance and any other Bible dictionary I can find with pictures and history and graphs and charts to try to kind of mind map 
my own personal life by seeing where I fit in in mm-hmm. history, where I fit in in the Bible, where do I fit in in the plan of God. And so for me growing up with that diversity, you know, my dad would teach me things like you get what you pay for. But my mom taught me to be frugal. Mm-hmm. So I harmonized those two, synchronized them and said, okay, I'm going to get the best quality for the best price. Mm-hmm. Nice. And so anytime I can get it at a discount, so like, for instance, you, all this wonderful podcasting equipment, I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to check all of my resources, see how much did you pay for it? <laughs> I'm going to get the same quality, but I'm maybe yeah. get a deal or get a good price, you know? And uh, so, and, you know, and in the Jewish world, that's being a stickler. You've mm-hmm. got to learn how to <laughs> one of my friends to, to actually manage yeah. money. Yeah, one of my it's friends. It's a strength. It is. One of my friends calls me the Mexican Jew. The <laughs> Mexican Jew. I'm like, what do you mean by that? He goes, man, you're so tight. Wow. Yes. Now, I'm in like, a world of anti-Semitism, yeah. I want to tread lightly on that one because a lot of people use terms that are mm. very anti-Semitic. Like, you know, in the marketplace, oh, I'm going to Jew you down. Oh, yeah. That's mm. such a slam to the Jewish person that's worked their whole life to make sure their family never has to suffer again in slavery, exile, yeah. or live as immigrants that are poor mm. and have no privileges here in a new country in America, but to actually use it as a strength. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I call it the wisdom of Solomon mm-hmm. to be able to say, you know what, whatever money I have, I'm going to make, I'll allow my money to make money. And it's not for just making money. And let me give you a tip on finances, because I know you're a finance guy. Uh, for sure. Both of you are for sure. you know, politically driven, yeah. financially driven. You have a business. You have yeah. a business. Um, and so one of the things that Jews think about is from creation, mm-hmm. God created the world that fell into what we call the fall. It's broken. It needs fixing. Mm-hmm. And the Hebrew term for this fix is called tikkun olam, which means to fix the world. So when you think about the Nobel Peace Prize winners and wow. the Pulitzer Prize oh, yeah. winners and all the people in the world oh, yeah. that have been ingenious like Solomon to give us the technology in our phones yeah. mm-hmm. through the Israeli mindset and, and wisdom sure. and other things in the world that's added so much yeah. to bringing peace in the world and bringing resolution in the world, Jews think of this world that God gave us, it's God-given. That's mm-hmm. good. And he entrusted it with mm-hmm. us. And if we see something's broken... Let's pour our resources into fixing it. Yeah. And this is what I believe God does on the other side of that. Okay, so I will trust you with my word, Jewish community, mm-hmm. Hebrew culture, right? People in Israel, Jews scattered around the world. I'll trust you with my world. And because I can trust you that you're trying to fix what's broken, That's good. Yeah. I will funnel the resources to you to fulfill that dream. So like an Einstein, Mm -hmm. you know, the resources to funnel to him to fulfill some dream he has or some other person that's done some great feat in life, it's the idea is that I just want to fix the world. Yeah. And you start with one person at a time, I always say. Start with yourself. Yeah. But how can I fix the world? And then the money just comes. And I would say like the Jewish community, like Nobel Peace Prize is one of the things you referenced. There's been about a thousand of them or less passed out one quarter of them are to Jewish people. Mm-hmm. And Jewish people, I think, are like less than 1% of the world population. They're yes. very small. Persecuted yes. people, I think there's less than 30 or million. I mean, it's a yeah. small number because yes. of all the atrocities mm-hmm. against them. Yes. So for a small population, they've had a huge impact in culture, in society, mm-hmm. and for those reasons. Yes, yeah. when you look at the statistics and you look at the demographics, it's yes. very true. Yes. Yeah, and uh, so so I told them, I told them, I'm not... I'm not tight. I'm just frugal. Yeah. You got to be good with your money. <laughs> okay, but see, there's another thing. The assumption is that Jews are tight. Yeah, no. No, Jews are wise. They're financially wise and in they're, many, they're, many different ways. Their, yeah. their goal is to fulfill the words of Solomon and Ecclesiastes that you're supposed to give an inheritance mm-hmm. to your children's children. Mm-hmm. So if an individual is overspending for personal gain or use or pleasure then they're actually robbing the next generations, plural, from the wealth they could be passing down as a legacy. That's good. So it's not a thing of being cheap or Mm -hmm. being stingy or being prudish. No, it's it's more like, let's be wise, let's be smart. For sure. And you think about it, the richest people in the world that have the wealth, they don't dress like they're rich. Never. But the people that want to be rich are out there trying to buy the designer clothes (laughs) to look rich as if rich people care about looking rich. For sure. They don't need to prove to themselves they're rich. Their bank account proves it, you know? Their resources prove it. Their charitable efforts prove it. For sure. Yeah. Not what they wear. Yeah, and that's good that you bring that up because it was very anti-Semitic of him to say that. Yeah. 
Um, but it's good that we're talking about this because sure. people need to hear that, hey, wait a minute, why are, you know, like, for example, most banks, most fi most financial Services. people in the financial mm -hmm. sector are Jews. Yes, yeah. yes, and, because they can be trusted with the wealth. And yeah. that industry basically controls the, the world. They do. Yes. So, and Christians should fall in that suit that they're spiritual yeah. sons and daughters of Abraham. So yeah. they so should just to fall. Learn. Yeah, because all they're doing is following biblical principles. Mm -hmm. And I think if the Christian world were to actually put more biblical principles in place, they would see some of the same outcome because yeah. it's not like God's choosing to pick one race over another, or one right. ethnic group over another mm -hmm. to bless. It's just the whoever is going to be trustworthy yeah. mm -hmm. with the resource. For sure. You know, going back to the initial question though, as far as your parents, your home situation as a child, um, mother and father together, mm -hmm. divorce come in, or what was that situation? Yeah. Like, how did that work itself out? Yeah, I remember the days when I was a teenager where I could tell the tension was rising. Mm -hmm. uh, again, coming from different states, different ethnicities, my mother actually uh, looks mulatto but when she was young she didn't even look black at all she had mm. and and usually in the south it's like you have an ounce of black blood you're black mm -hmm. but really it depended on how you came out of the womb looking mm. so for instance slaves in the field were usually darker skin those who ran the house management that were in the house i won't even use the term because i have to use the n-word but mm -hmm. they were in the house doing the management, not in the fields. And so um, it went back to my my great-grandmother was also, uh, she was kin to Bing Crosby. She's Ellen B. Crosby. She was, she had an African mother and Bing's uncle hmm. was her dad. And so she raised Bing Crosby. And I'm, wow. I may be alerting somebody from Bing's family is going, what? I never heard that story. Yeah, you would have not heard that story because it was hush hush in those days. But she mm -hmm. raised, basically fed and took care of Bing and his sister when they were young. Wow. And Absolutely. and then and slavery kind of ended. And then the, um, the plantation owner, who was the Crosby, uh, Dennis Crosby, he was the one that gave land to the family. And so many years ago, I remember my mother saying, hey, we have land in Mobile, Alabama, and it's being sold, and we're all getting a portion. I'm like, where did we get land from? It went back to slavery days. Oh, wow. But my mother had just enough black blood for them to recognize that and put that on her birth certificate. But growing up, if a black person who's a friend of hers came to her, walked up to her, talked to her, the police would want to arrest him and say, ma'am, is this man bothering you? Oh, wow. Yeah, and so... So, so then your mother was half? Well, it's not even a half situation because the white... Um, there is white blood in every generation all the way back to her grandmother. Oh, so I see. again, because mm -hmm. her father was a plantation owner and he was 100% white. And so there was a mixture in those slave days all the time mm -hmm. going on with, you know, especially during slavery, where the plantation owners would have children through the slaves. Mm -hmm. And so I remember growing up, though, my mother saying, see this nose? This is a Jewish nose. And it turns out the Stallworth name um, even goes back to Jews from England. Hmm. And mm -hmm. so that was more of an ownership name, like we own slaves under this name. And so the thing I discovered growing up is my parents were so different, it eventually led to them divorcing. At what age, roughly? Oh, I believe I was 15 when it was official. Okay, so as but, a teenager, you started mm -hmm. to see the f mm -hmm. cracks. Or the mm -hmm. yeah, and then... I remember the first time I went to youth camp and was just like emotionally distraught over the fact that my parents were getting a divorce. And that was the year I got filled with the Holy Spirit because mm -hmm. I was crying out to God like, God, fix my broken family. Wow. And I came back on fire for God and all the insecurity I used to have as a child growing up, being kind of a chubby kid, I immediately had this burst of boldness that came out of me because the Holy Spirit empowered my life. And next thing you know, I was kind of like okay with my parents getting the divorce. Like, hey, so you guys don't kill each other. Mm -hmm. I'm actually wanting you to get the divorce because I realize you're not happy together. So in some ways, in the breakup of your biological family, mm -hmm. and then you come to Christ and you have a spiritual family, and yes. so that's why you embrace your Christianity so much. And I also embrace my brothers in the Lord like real brothers, yeah. uh, like physical DNA, and friends of mine. I've always treated them as an only child, like you are my extended family, or you are my brothers. You know, and let me say something to that, because I think it's so important. Sometimes we spend so much time honoring our biological, but not our spiritual. Yeah. And I think what we always, like, like sometimes people will walk away from, I don't know, 
I don't go to that church anymore, so I don't talk to those people at all. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. you're treading you're treating lightly something that's I think very sacred. Like mm-hmm. God put you in spiritual circles and in relationships for a very important reason. Mm-hmm. Like your biological family, you're not gonna spend eternity with. Yeah. Some of them, yeah. having said, yeah. but, but but your spiritual family, you will. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's real important that we honor, um, yeah. go out of our way to like truly love and not like treat it lightly. Yeah. Our spiritual relationships that we have. Yeah. I've always felt, you know, that blood is thicker than water thing that's so funny. Well, I think I think Oil is, is almost thicker, it's thicker than, than the blood. You know, it's like it's mm. that thick oil mm-hmm. of the the Holy Spirit that mm-hmm. unites us all together, that makes it's us good. a stronger bond sure. than our blood DNA bonds that we have with our family, because it's the spiritual DNA that actually makes us one, mm-hmm. right? Well said. So basically, by Powerful. 15 years old, there's a divorce, and your, mm-hmm. your mom and dad go separate ways. You stay with your mom? I stay with my mom. Okay. I would see my dad on the weekends. Usually, it's about every couple of weeks I'd stay with my dad. My dad actually... Sadly enough, the marriage fell apart through an affair, um, and then that became a marriage, a second marriage mm-hmm. for my dad. And then I had suddenly this sister, and uh, it's so funny, we're friends on Facebook, Juanita, and uh, after many years we got reconnected. But the funny thing is, it's like my dad had another family. Mm. And then I had to figure out, what does that mean for me? So I'm not like most kids where I s- thought that maybe the divorce was because of me, because some kids blame themselves. They do. A lot of right? kids do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I figured out that I was the one that was supposed to fix them somehow. Right. And I couldn't fix them, of course. But it's funny because I still filter couples that I counsel today with my wife through the dysfunction that I saw in my own parents. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so it's a it's almost like I wanted to fix them, so I'm vicariously fixing them through the new couples that I get to counsel and help. Yeah, and having said that, when there is a divorce, it's not the kid's fault at all. It's not the kid's They're fault. They're not guilty of anything. It's just two parents that couldn't keep keep going along together in the same road. Right. So, but they are the ones that get affected the most. the most. They do suffer the how most. Did, how did that affect you personally? And Because, I mean, ever since I met you, you look like you've had a perfect family. But, yeah. <laughs> but it must have affected you, and you overcame it. And so if there's somebody listening that that is going through something like that, of seeing their parents get divorced, I mean, that has to affect yeah. the children in a big way. How did it affect you and how did you overcome that? Well, first of all, I have to say that I felt like I was watching an I Love Lucy show when I would, mm-hmm. you know, experience the differences in my family. Because, you know, like Lucy and Ricky, mm-hmm. you know, it's interesting dynamic there because they're different. I feel like I was trying to keep that happy home together. And then when I realized it fell apart and it was beyond my control and it wasn't my fault, it had nothing to do with it. If I hadn't received the infilling of the Holy Spirit, Mm -hmm. I don't think I would have been able to be as secure as a young person as I was. Even then, still, we all have our issues. But I feel like it helped ground me Mm -hmm. to just, you know, not only just have the Holy Spirit in my life, but have a spiritual family in my life to where I didn't miss a beat. And it, I found myself wanting to be at church all the time. And I remember my mother was, was raised Baptist, so I wasn't raised Jewish. People ask me, like, oh, so what was it like being a, a Jew now coming to Christ? I said, first of all, you need to know, mm-hmm. I knew Jesus before I knew that I was a Jew. So it was the reverse. And my dad was raised Catholic. And my dad did not want to go to the Baptist church, and he would fight my mother on it. I'm going to stay home. And, and that's a black Baptist church. A black Baptist which is church. usually almost Pentecostal. I mean, in terms well, of expression. They were, a, they were kind of like almost Baptocostal, like they right. were the shouting Baptists. Mm-hmm. But they sent me to a Pentecostal school that was more like Southern white Pentecostal school. Which, right? AG, was that right? A, uh, well, it wasn't AG to start. I was with the Pentecostal Church of God, okay. PC of G. So very similar, like on a smaller scale, they're like a small scale AG, Mm -hmm. Assembly of God. And then later I started going to Assembly of God churches. But especially when I met Pastor Obed, that Mm -hmm. changed everything. But with my family growing up, I would go to the Baptist church. My dad would not go with us. And the only time I ever went to a Catholic church is when I'd visit Louisiana, because everything's parishes and Catholic churches, you know. And so I would go to either my grandmother's church or or something, you know, near my uncle's house, or something, you know, that was connected to the family, or I'd see my dad's Catholic school he would go to, and he'd point to it, and then we'd end up going to that cathedral. But I really didn't identify with the Catholic Church at all. Mm -hmm. I I could respect the tradition, the liturgy, and all that, but I really didn't understand, like, 
it felt cold. Mm-hmm. Even the building felt cold. You walk in the doors, like big old heavy doors. You yeah. walk in there, like this big breeze hits you. And I'm like, man, this place is cold. And then to me, being familiar with not only Baptist and now later Pentecostal churches, I was like, this place is dead. You know, and of course I have a, you know, a certain respect level for my grandmother who was Catholic and she was just the sweetest Catholic. For sure. She had nothing to, she, and in fact, I think it was the secret Jewish blood in the family that she didn't have rosaries that you saw in the house. Oh, wow. There was no statues, little altars, idols, none of that. And they would typically go on a Friday night or a Saturday, which happens to be the Sabbath. Mm-hmm. And I think it was a secret Jewish thing that nobody talked about why we do this, but it was just a passed on tradition. But my experiences in the Baptist church was with my mom, and it was hard not having my father being a spiritual leader in the home. Never. Never. Right. Well, because he didn't really, he had disconnected from his faith, because mm-hmm. for him, it all ended when he would ask questions and the ruler from the nuns would hit his uh, knuckles. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, he talks still with an accent. Did he always, like, he, like his to me, accents, he sounds like right out of Louisiana. Like oh, just... no, his accent's so much lighter these days than oh. when he grew up. But over the years, the California accent has kicked in because my wife's in, okay. the same way with the Jersey accent. Mm-hmm. She sounds more like a Californian now than she used to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it used to be a cup of coffee. Coffee. Mm-hmm. She doesn't say coffee anymore. <laughs> you know, so, and especially because she practices it saying it, saying yeah. coffee, coffee. No, coffee. I like to, I like to say yeah. coffee, you know. So my dad, you know, didn't go to church. And this is what he'd tell my mother. Well, how do you know that when you go to church, I'm not praying here? And I thought about that for years. And all of a sudden it hit me like, why would he say, why do, how do you know? Why would he not just say, hey, when you go to church, I open my Bible and I pray to God and I read my Bible here. Mm-hmm. He said, well, how do you know? It reminds me of that serpent in the in the garden that said, did God really say? Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, man, my dad really has nothing to offer me. The only thing he had on his walls were a lot of books. Some of those books were New Age books that were like Aquarian Gospel Society books that he ordered, ordered mm-hmm. through a book club. And he would try to show me, oh, here's the book of Jasher, and here's all these books on aliens and all this meditation stuff. Practiced none of it. Right. But he had this trivia knowledge about all of it. Yeah. And that made me hungry to learn and be knowledgeable like him with books. Oh, yeah. So that's why I still have a love for books to this day. Is that where you get it from, from your dad? Yes, I actually do get it from my dad. Mm. So there's, the, it's like the thing I told you about, you know, you get what you pay for. That's ingrained in me because of my dad. And then be frugal because I was ingrained by watching my mother watch every penny, you know, look at his credit card bills and say, why do you have golf clubs so many times on here? Because he'd replace the clubs all the time or so many reclining chairs or a new car every year. My dad always had to have new, new, new. Now, now having known you, Rabbi, obviously there were some probably some challenges as he developed another family. But as an adult, you and your father have gotten close again. I mean, relatively oh, close. Oh, he's yeah. over every Sunday for a Sunday dinner, yeah. So I would say that over time there's been like healing and oh. coming back together, correct? Yeah. After, you know, when I got filled with the Holy Spirit, especially when I became a young adult, I think I got the nerve to finally confront him one day and say, Mm. Dad, I really needed you in these Mm -hmm. years. Why weren't you there for me? Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? Because I was the kid that was trying to be the sports fanatic like he loved and he was fanatical about, but I could never measure up to him being the quarterback in high school or, you know, Mm. being his love for sports. So I was at a Christian school. What did we play? Flag football. Talk about lackluster yeah, you know it was sure. like oh so my dad only came to a couple of my games yeah and i could only count on my hand how many times he took me to a park to throw a football i'm thinking man you were the quarterback you should have been like teaching me how, how to be a pro so and we, yet i suffered yeah. not doing so great i was a great lineman because i could muster up some anger and frustration mm. about my parents divorcing and knock you on your rear wow but it's not because i was that great of an athlete you know i could play soccer because i could run fast and like accelerate fast Basketball, I sucked at. I still suck at it because it's just like nobody showed me how to really get that, you know, the ball in the, in oh, the hoop. We were about to invite you, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Forget about it. I will cheer you on. I'll be your therapist after you're injured, but I will not play basketball. No help. One day, maybe I'll get yeah. the nerve to, you know, so, practice with so nobody right. watching and nobody doing Instagram and yeah. showing yeah. Me, showing pictures of me. So how did it go in that in that uh, intervention? Did, did it go well with your dad? You know... When I began to share with him how I felt. And this is in the 20s, 30s? How old are you? I think I was um, turning about 20, maybe 19, 20. Okay. You know, I think it was definitely before I hit 21. I, he began to cry. 
Mm. And he started telling me all the things he was trying to do to not push the envelope and, you know, honor my mother's wishes. And yet my mother was the one pushing for him to be more of a dad. Mm -hmm. But he was staying back and pushing away because of shame. Because he felt like he had not done the job he needed to do. And he started crying about it. And I'm like, I didn't say all this to make you cry. And I'd never seen my dad cry. Except in one fight he had with my mother where, sadly enough, the N-word came up towards my mm. mom. And I'll never forget how she boohooed and cried for almost two days like she was going to have a nervous breakdown. And I was so paralyzed at the bottom of the stage, not going upstairs to hug her or see her because I was like, as much as I'm dest I'm like completely frustrated and hurting inside that my mom's crying, I don't know I can handle hugging her and her falling apart on me. Mm -hmm. I was just too young to know, mm -hmm. you know, what to do. And so to this day, I can't stand to see a woman cry mm -hmm. because it just, you know, except at the altar, then it's like boohoo all you want. Get all those, uh, uh, get all that makeup off, girl. Just let yeah. it all cry out, so, right? So let me just dig in here just for a second. Yeah. So potentially there's fathers that may watch this, children yeah. that may watch this. And I've watched like different uh, families for, sometimes the man's, you know, done everything wrong. Mm -hmm. Like he's done, he's done the things wrong and the family breaks up. And sometimes it's infidelity. Sometimes it's just different yeah. reasons. So, and a lot of times the father gets distant from the child. Yes. And then the child sort of like gets a hard heart toward the father. Yes. And obviously it didn't take but three, four years. I mean, that's relatively soon. I mean, I've, I've, yeah. I've seen, you know, young people mm -hmm. won't talk to their dad for 10 years, a decade plus. Mm -hmm. So I never stopped talking to my dad. I okay. would still stay in connection because it was, that's that. And you put in the work or people. your father did? I was putting in the work. My dad didn't know how to do the work. There you go. He didn't know what the work was. Well said. Right? Mm -hmm. So what I began to do is I began to continue to meet with him, go to movies, go to dinner, all those things, invite him into my so family. So you made yourself available to him, like, hey, yeah. dad, hey, dad. Yeah. So much so that he became a roommate before I got married. Wow. So my dad divorced the second time from his second wife, who was also from... Um, by the way, from Louisiana. It's so funny, he, you know, married someone from, yeah. She was also black. Hmm. So, but she was Creole. So she had talked, that mixture. Talked funny too. Yeah. Or was that thick yeah, accent? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. The, she lived in California her whole, most of her life too. So she lost some of that. But the funny thing was after the second marriage, I remember feeling like I never want to be like my dad because I don't want a divorce. Mm -hmm. And I waited till I was 35. I told everybody in my 20s, I won't marry till I'm like 35. And I'm going to be searching and hunting for someone that can be a minister's mm -hmm. wife and that I'm not going to divorce mm -hmm. because I didn't want to be like my father. Mm -hmm. And my his third marriage was actually just to help somebody with their papers because they weren't a citizen. Mm -hmm. And it was just a two-year commitment, and he hoped she'll stay with me, right? Because I've done this for her. She'll take care of me. Mm -hmm. And she was younger. And she, old, he was older in age. That didn't work out, of course. After two years, they divorced as the plan was. I'm helping yeah. you become a citizen. And I shouldn't probably say that on a podcast, mm -hmm. but it's, it's what happened, right? Truth, and a lot yeah. of people go through that. Okay, so then I realized that, you know what, I needed to heal completely because mm -hmm. what I found was, instead of being angry, I was indifferent. Mm -hmm. I see my father, I'm like, oh, that's my dad. And like, if I invited him over, it was kind of like, okay, you sit on the couch, I sit on the couch. Maybe we might have a few things to say mutually, but we're off in different directions. But you still, and here's one thing I would give for advice to anybody that's listening or watching in the future. I, I, I think rather than allow, like if you've had a father good for 20 years, like he's been there, and then some along, along the way, everybody makes mistakes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not time to burn down that bridge, bridge. destroy that relationship, right. say, I'm going to be done. And a lot of times in difficult situations, i.e. divorces, uh, young people will like, okay, I'm done with you. I'm, I'm going to be on this side. I'm on mom's side or I'm on dad's side. Mm -hmm. And whichever side it is, there's always bad on both sides when I mean, those yeah. kind of situations happen. And I think it's important to do what you did yeah. and lived out. And that's hard to do. You have to really yeah. be walking in a lot of mercy and grace. Yeah. To Thank say, God for the Lord being in my life. For sure. Right? For so sure. that helped. But even Christian folks mm -hmm. who we're close to choose the other way. Mm -hmm. And I would truly say like one of the things about Christians is we forgive. Like, mm -hmm. That's one of the things. Mm -hmm. The big message of Christianity is that Christ forgave us, therefore we forgive others. And our yeah. even in the Lord's Prayer, right? Mm -hmm. our, our forgiveness is attached to our forgiveness yes. of others. Yes. And so... I would strongly say to any young person in a situation like this where a father and mother go sideways or whatever it is, to still try to maintain a relationship with that yeah, father absolutely. or mother. It's absolutely. so important. Yeah. Rather than saying, I'm done with you, I'll never talk to you, and I've, I've heard those words and seen those people live out that yeah. life, that is not, I don't think, as much a Christ-honoring way of living. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. what you did, although hard, yeah. very challenging, it's nonetheless the way that a person should try to be, yes. even if they're like the kid that's sort of the victim. Yes. But it's uh, it's human nature. It's the flesh. It is a flesh. You're being led by the flesh and saying, well, you know, wait, your, your you. dad did mm -hmm. 
a hundred things right and you're gonna condemn him for one wrong thing correct you know, it's the fle- it's, it's human nature to do that so on both yeah, sides so the good. father did something out of the flesh and then the kids not forgiving did something mm, out of the flesh right so it makes a bad point. situation worse yeah. yeah and i think doing what rabbi has done and i've seen some people after i'm like hey hey mm. keep reaching out to your father i know whatever yeah. happened but he still needs you he was 20 years of a good father yeah. what would christ do and so it's more that kind of thing to get people to reach back out yeah. and do that. So, Rabbi, what would you have done differently Ooh, if good. you if you would have not met Jesus? Because mm-hmm. because it happened, you told you told us it happened pretty soon after your parents' divorce. Yeah. What, so, what would you have done differently if God wasn't in your life? Well, of course, I was raised in a in a not only in a Christian home, but I was raised going to Christian school mm-hmm. for ten years. So from pre-kindergarten all the way to ninth grade, my 10th grade year, I was at a public school, Banning High School, Phoenix Banning High in Wilmington. And so I I can't say that it was like there was some point where Jesus came into my life. The difference was it was empowered by the Holy Spirit. For sure. um, Baptizing me with power and giftings that gave me that extra boldness to confront my dad Mm -hmm. and speak truth to him, even though it hurt him. But yet that's how the healing began because we were able to confront, right? And you can't change what you don't, mm-hmm. you won't, you're not willing to confront. So for me, I had to then realize, I didn't realize how indifferent I was towards him to where it was like this routine of, okay, we're going to see each other once a week. Or now that he's living with me pre-marriage, you know, my dad was my roommate, you know, because my dad after his second divorce... So funny, his wife then gets leukemia and dies. Mm. And um, this was after they had separated and were in the process of divorce. And so he needed some place to stay. So he calls me up and says, hey, um, can we get an apartment together? And I was already moved out from my mom. You know, I was going to college at the time. I had moved to Orange County. I think it was in Cerritos, California. I was very comfortable where I was renting a room from an Argentinian family. By the way, that family was sending their son to the same Bible college my wife was at in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, (laughs) Jimmy Swagger Bible College before the big fall, right? And and so we had mutual friend that you know that uh, we were connected to, and I had to move and move to Buena Park with my dad because we found an apartment together, Hmm. and then we were kind of like moving from place to place, uh, Dominguez Hills, and then we finally moved to the desert together. And it was one month after I moved in December 9, 2003, that I met Magali in, well, it was actually end of January, beginning of February when I met her before I got married in Detroit, Michigan. So for me, it was an interesting thing living with my dad, but it was kind of like this thing. We weren't really that connected because I grew indifferent towards him. Mm -hmm. He was just a roommate, just like some people in a marriage Mm -hmm. can grow indifferent towards each Mm -hmm. other and just live as roommates. And so it wasn't until I got married that I realized it's not easy to be a husband and a father. No. And so I started having compassion on my dad (laughs) and started realizing also this is what my dad was stuck trying to figure out. Yeah. And I realized I was the one deficient because I didn't have a father that knew how to do it. So I don't know how to do it. You didn't learn it. Yeah. I didn't learn it from example. Yeah. I only knew what the Bible said about it. And it's one thing to know the principle. It's another Mm. thing to apply it because experiential. You saw it growing up. You saw how a husband should treat a wife, how a father should treat a child. That's really good. And, and, you know, Rabbi, even in the ideal situation, like my mom and dad were always together, right? Yeah. Married almost 50 years before my father passed. Um, There's still levels of brokenness in every home situation. So there's Absolutely. not like a perfect father. No. And so I think all of us have a distorted image of the father, and sometimes we impose that on on, Christ, mm-hmm. on God, right? Our mm-hmm. relationship with him as well. But I would say to any person that's even out there listening, nothing's going to be perfect. So there's mm-hmm. always just imperfect fathers doing hopefully a little better than what they had experienced, and yeah. hopefully they're maturing and growing. So there's nothing that's perfect or ideal. I say that all the time, and this is how I word it. We have a tendency to that's filter good. our Heavenly Father through our earthly father. Oh, yes, we that's do. That's good. And one of the girls I dated from the Christian school I was going to at the time, we were friends growing up, and then I'm finally, you know, we end up dating. She said, you keep talking about God as your father. And that's because, and I wrote about this in the book I'm writing on, my life story, that I had to depend on God as my father because I didn't have an earthly father to lead me and guide me mm-hmm. the way I needed him to as a spiritual father in the mm-hmm. home. So... She said to me one day, you keep saying, you know, how you pray to God as your father. I said, yeah, well, it's in the Lord's Prayer, you know, mm-hmm. our Father which art in mm-hmm. heaven. And she goes, no, no, you don't understand. It's not the words. It's the concept I can't get through. 
I said, what do you mean? She goes, well, I don't have a dad. Mm -hmm. And her mother and aunt raised her, and she was living at home at that time. And it was so, it was so funny because this all came to a head the same year I got filled with the Holy Spirit at a summer camp, at a youth camp, went through the Pentecostal Church of God. And she got filled with the Holy Spirit because I, after I got filled with the Holy Spirit, I laid my hands on her and was like praying in my head, God, I don't know what to pray for like I should. Mm -hmm. And literally the Holy Spirit started praying through me wow. to pray for her. So I got filled with the Holy Spirit interceding for her all at the same time. And then she started speaking in tongues and mm -hmm. praying in the Spirit. And so it was interesting that out of that, she, I said, can I ask you, what were you praying for at the altar before I laid hands on you? She goes, I was praying for, to get filled with the Holy Spirit. And I was struggling because it wasn't flowing. It wasn't coming. And I said, that's so funny because I thought you were praying because you had an unhappy home or something because you told me that you didn't have your dad in your life. Mm. But she says, you're right. I still struggle to this day praying to God as a father mm -hmm. because I don't know what a father is like. Yeah. So I have a hard time seeing God as my father. He's just some guy who's never around mm -hmm. because God is the, it Makes must sense. be like my dad because my dad was never around. Mm -hmm. So I believe that that's the number one dilemma we have. Malachi sure. talks about it, sure. that the hearts of the fathers need to turn back to the children, and then the children will turn back to the father. For sure. And we have a fatherless generation we're dealing with. For sure. With. Let me say one thing that really helped me, because we're in this God thing for just for a second. I never realized how much God loved me until I had my own children. Oh, mm -hmm. absolutely. Like a full revelation of like, and I know I'm just like a, a shallow if 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 god is ten thousand foot feet deep i'm like a half an inch deep yeah but like once you have kids and you're like look at this kid and yeah. you love so this true. kid and you That's dream good. about and think about this kid and you love them immensely and then all of a sudden something begin to click inside my spirit we're like wait a second yeah the comparison that god has toward me is that of a father and i only think a father can understand yes. how much the father loves yes. us if you are a father yes yes and i have to say like once yes. i had children it's like yeah. How can I love this thing so much, yeah, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. it, it has all these issues and all these other things, but I just love it, and it breaks all my stuff, and I just love it. And, and there's all these, like, heartbreaks and ups and downs, but I just love this kid. And yeah. I, I will say, like, in terms of my own spiritual walk, once I had children mm -hmm. and I loved them, I understood a little bit more how God could love me. I have a similar a scenario in that, but it, for me, because I was forced early, living with my mom, even walking home to school every day without someone to take me, you know, pick me up and that kind of stuff. My mother would be working all night, single mom, right, taking care of me. I would trust on God to be my father. Mm -hmm. And my father was walking me home from school. Mm. And so God was with me, and I would have these talks with God on this walk through Banning Park and down uh, to Lackme Avenue where I uh, lived in an apartment with my mother. And I remember the intimate times with the Lord I would have. Now, where the father thing comes in for me is I became a father after I was already a pastor. Mm. And I became a rabbi after I became a husband mm -hmm. going into being a father. So this is what the difference was for me. Here I was pastoring a church with Pastor Obed. I mean, you know, 2003, we launched the church. And um, I knew that this was all a God plan. But as far as pastoring... A church that was different for me it's mm -hmm. like oh yeah guess what you get a label stamped on you you're now the executive pastor <laughs> i'm a what what's an executive pastor is what that like do? an associate or is yeah. that like an assistant it was this new term nobody knew what it was mm -hmm. and pastor bed was a senior pastor and then i was the executive pastor it's like wow i'm an executive pastor mm -hmm. whatever that is mm -hmm. you know and then when i got married of course which was after we started the church right i met her about a month and a half after we started it but it was like I still don't understand pastoring yet. Hmm. So when I became a husband, it added a layer of the, like the way Christ loves the church, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There you go. the way a husband should love a, a wife, a bride. And so there was one revelation of that love deepened for me, right? From father to, to a son to now a husband to a wife. And there, here's what happened. So then I became a rabbi after Pastor Bed met the rabbi that later trained me in Desert Hot Springs. And I am now called by this rabbi, his spiritual son, in front of all of destiny. Hmm. The prayer shawl, the tallit, went over my shoulders, and he did the blessing on me of number 624 through 26. He says, I'm going to let you guys know, Destiny Church, he's not a rabbi because I'm calling him to be a rabbi. He was called in his mother's womb to be a rabbi. Mm. But this ceremony is calling him my spiritual son. Wow. And so I accepted that sonship, and from that day forward, 
Destiny knew me as both Pastor Brian and Rabbi. Mm-hmm. And so all my Bible college students would say, oh, if you're, that means teacher, then you're the rabbi. So mm-hmm. I would get yeah. that from all my Bible college students. But the process of being a rabbi still needed to be built out further because a real rabbi is a spiritual son. I mean, excuse me, a rabbi is a spiritual father to spiritual sons. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's what Jesus, the role he was playing, wow. right? Everlasting father, mm-hmm. prince of peace, right? So I, I didn't understand that until I had my daughter Eliana. Mm. And that was right after we went to Israel, because in my timeline, she was conceived in Israel, in the Galilee. And right after we came back, I was on a trip to Brazil to to do a wedding for a member whose family member was, uh, they were all from Brazil. So they fly me out to Brazil, and I told the father of the bride, who was of um, um, Arab descent, and he spoke Arabic, he was trying to learn Hebrew. I said, hey, I'm going to let you know, when I get back home, my wife's going to tell me she's pregnant. Mm-hmm. So I get back home. My wife's still staying up. She normally she'd be asleep. I'm driving in from LAX. She has a little jewelry box for me. And I opened it up thinking there's jewelry inside and uh, thought it was a bracelet because that's the shape of the box. It was the pregnancy oh, test. Wow. And nice. I said, I knew it. I told the father of the bride that I was going to have a child. When I had Eliana, mm-hmm. whose name means God is answered mm-hmm. in Hebrew, when I had her, I discovered the love of God on a whole new level. Mm-hmm. Now I understood what pastoring was. Now I understood what being a rabbi yeah. is. It's wow. being a spiritual parent mm-hmm. to all the people that God sends you. Like Jesus said, mm-hmm. all that you've given, I've been faithful, except for the son of perdition, I've been faithful to reveal your name to them, to reveal the fatherhood of God to them, right? And so when I think about that journey of being a pastor, then becoming a rabbi, being a, a husband, and then becoming a father, they all taught me levels of love of what a father really should be yeah. that I didn't have growing up. I had it, but it was in crazy. it was in blueprint form. It wasn't like built out. And so now I knew what it felt like to build a house yeah. to where people feel loved. And now I'm I'm actually not just an executive pastor, I'm a campus pastor mm-hmm. that really gets a shepherd sheep, but more importantly have sons and daughters of the house raised up and it's an exciting journey. That's beautiful. I want to share a couple of statistics about this topic since we're in it, um, about a fatherless home and how important is it to have mm-hmm. uh, for men to step up and, and be the father that God has called them to be, or even just do the, respon- the, the right thing, which is a responsible thing to do. Check this out. 63% of youth suicides come from fatherless homes. 71% of pregnant teenage- teenagers come from fatherless homes. Mm-hmm. of youth sitting in prison come from fatherless homes. Mm -hmm. Children from fatherless homes are four times more likely to live in poverty. Children from fatherless homes are 10 times more likely to use drugs. Mm -hmm. And children from fatherless homes are 14 14 times more likely to commit rape. And uh, children from fatherless homes are 32 more times likely to run away from home. Mm -hmm. Wow. Prodigals. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of statistics in regards to a big dilemma in the world today. For sure. And people don't realize why God hates divorce. Mm -hmm. Because it leads sons and daughters, it leaves them fatherless and without a mother that's constantly there for them. And the family dynamic is being attacked. Mm -hmm. And I think that's Satan's plan. For sure. Is to destroy the family unit because Mm -hmm. he wants to destroy the children. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And man, it is so important to have those roles of mom and dad. I mean, from creation, God knew we needed that. For yeah. sure. And there's been an attack on the family. Just there to has be been honest, absolutely. huge attack on the family. Yes. And I think it's multi pronged. I've tried always to reframe this like our, our world tries to tell us like kids are our burden mm. when the Bible clearly says they're a blessing. They're a blessing. And like, blessed is the man whose quiver is full. If you have right. lots of children, yes. it's a blessing. It's a blessing. And so I think we need to push back on that narrative. And so, like, in terms of like, say for example, children, they're a blessing. And then as far as being a father, it's an honor. And it's, yes. a, it's, it's, it's something we embrace and enjoy. It's not yeah. something we despise and want to run from and I don't know, want to be whatever, but it's something that we enjoy. And it's, it's a gift from God to even be a father. Yeah, like you yes. said, uh, honor is the perfect word. Mm-hmm. It's an honor to be a father. Mm-hmm. It is. Yeah. Lead the next generation. So I have a question for you, Rabbi. How does your, fa- how does your faith influence your approach of, on fatherhood? Hmm. Hmm. It's good. Um, well, faith to me, the the actual Greek term pisteo actually means like whether you're, you're talking about to believe, mm-hmm. it means to be persuaded. So the Bible persuades me 
that not only can I be a good father, but I have a good father in heaven to model. Mm -hmm. And so even though I feel like sometimes I'm deficient in having an earthly model to follow from my family upbringing and traditions, I've learned to be a better father, not so much in spite of my dad, but because I'm rebuilding that relationship with my father, I realize if I'm honest, his generation was challenged with fathering. For sure. My dad's generation was challenged from fathering. So my my grandfather, I look at my grandfather though, and I'll never get the day that my first time meeting him, I was 13 years of age, other than talking on the phone. I go to Louisiana because my grandparents didn't fly. So we had to go to them. And at 13, my dad took me for the first time to Baton Rouge. And my grandfather, grandfather picks us up from the airport. I'll never forget how he received me. He picked me up and swirled me around, mm. and it was the most elating nice. feeling in the world. It's like, wow, yeah. is this what fatherhood feels like? Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, why didn't I? Why have I never been swirled around before by my dad? Mm. You know, but it was like he met me for the first time, picks me up, swirls me around. We get in the car, and this is what's funny. My dad has this tradition of like when he picked me up from school, he would put his right hand on my left knee, just like a fatherly pat. You know, just like, hey, mm. son. And he had a stick shift, so it would go from the stick shift to every once in a while, pat on the knee, and then back to the stick shift. So I didn't interpret that as love because I'm like, I don't know what that is, but it's kind of like it doesn't make any sense to me. I don't know yeah. why he does that. But I'm sitting in the back seat of my grandpa's car, and my dad gets in the car. I get in the back seat. Grandpa's ready to you know, take off, get home from the airport. First trip there, and all of a sudden I magically see him go from his stick shift to put his hand on my dad's knee. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. This is love. Mm -hmm. This is my grandfather showing his son wow, love, who is my dad. And then my dad passed it down to me yeah. and would do that, like, son, here you go, like a pat mm -hmm. on the back kind of thing. And it was like, it was not weird. It was just, it was like, I didn't know what it meant to him. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know what it was supposed to mean to me. And now I see what it meant because that was generational love being passed down. Yeah. So now I felt proud every time my dad would do that. Like, hey, son, you know, I, I recognize you. You're my son, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm your only son. So I can just imagine, you know, you look at the Bible, and you've got Abraham and Isaac. That's his, your only son. Mm -hmm. You know, and God says you got to give him up. You know, it's like that's the test of a lifetime, right? The son that I waited so long to have. I'm a hundred, uh, Heavenly Father, and you're taking my son away? You made promises. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like the Bible has been my number one blueprint for what it means to be a father and how to act as one. So yeah. I go to the Bible for everything. And I think I've tried to share as much as possible to other young men that don't know how to father, don't know how to be a husband. Let's just look at what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. Look how Jesus loved the disciples. He says, love others as I've loved you. He set the tone for love your neighbors yourself, right? This is how it's shown and embodied. This is how it's modeled and model me and show it to others. So when I saw my grandfather do it to my dad, I realized even though he never explained to me what that was, because we didn't have that bond, at least I know in this family there is love being passed down. It just never interpreted the correct way. Mm -hmm. So if we can teach people how to like use the, the Bible as a model yeah. for what a husband, a father, a man should be, we wouldn't have most of the problems in our world today For if sure. we could just model even learning from the mistakes mm -hmm. of the patriarchs and the people in the Bible that had pitfalls. How to get back up. A righteous man falls seven times. He gets back up each time. You, you've already tipped into it, but characteristics you think that are important as a father in raising children? I know your, your daughter yeah. Eliana is, I think, 16 now or 15? She's turning 16 in July. I'll be 55 July 19th. She'll go. be... 16 on July 20th. She's would, my belated gift. What would you, yeah, exactly. What would you say are characteristics that would help a father in raising maybe a, a young lady or just a child in general? It's good that you asked me that because lately yeah, I've been question. I've been sharing a lot with my wife my new perspective mm -hmm. of raising a teenager, mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. a young lady, no longer a little cute girl. I have to say, honey, you look beautiful versus you look cute. And she basically at this age, mm -hmm. usually your kids give you a pushback. They don't need you. Um, let them do it on their own. They're trying to find autonomy and their own self-reliance to do things. And they don't want the help, but really they deeply desire for someone to journey with them and show them the way because they don't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. 
So what I've done is be the silent partner sitting on the side of her bed saying, honey, so how was school today? Well, what kind of work do you have today? Do you need any help? You know, and if she tells me no, that's fine. But most of the time, the initial no is not really a no. It's like, I don't want to admit that I don't know how to do it. Mm. So I'm going to try to do it on my own, even if I have to rely on my friends and call them up for the answers. I said, honey, I'm right here. If you need my help, I'll help you. So I've learned to not be like, well, you're doing it all wrong. You're, I'll never forget the day that my dad looked at my math homework and he said, hey, son, why did you make this dumb mistake? Mm. I didn't hear dumb mistake. I heard, why are you so dumb? And that's years ago and how you years still remember ago. word by word. Oh, it's crazy. To this day, I tell people, especially in our Becoming Free group, I said that was something I had to become free from because yeah. I yeah. thought my dad was calling me dumb. So guess what I have done since? I'm self-educated. I'm self-taught because no one's going to ever call me dumb again. Yeah. But he never called me dumb. He just said, why'd you make this dumb mistake? Because to him, math came easy, and I loved math, but I made, I didn't follow the steps. And so instead of showing me, hey, son, I think you missed a step here. That's why the answer came out wrong. He called it a dumb mistake. So I forever refuted that dumb label that I thought was being put on me. And I was self-taught because of it. And that's why I am where I am today, because I don't wait for people to teach me anything. I'm going to go find it, learn it, so that nobody calls me dumb ever again. Mm -hmm. But in the sense of me helping my daughter, I had to learn not to enable her lack of doing it for herself and studying for herself and lack, Mm -hmm. lack of effort. I had to just be there and support her, listen to her stories. I even said, hey, if you're, if you're liking some guy or dating some guy or whatever, yeah, I, will, I want to know about it. Hey, I counsel people mm-hmm. for a living, you know, so like, you know, let me know. I might be able to add some advice to help you out. And they're like, she looked at me like, really? You would want to know? Mm-hmm. Like, you don't have to hide anything from me. Just tell me. If you mm-hmm. like some guy, hey, you know, you seem like a good kid. This, this, even that concept speaks to, I think, sometimes we're stronger in the broken places. Mm-hmm. So when your father did that to you, yeah. like, I, I was hearing a story of Elon Musk and his father did something similar to him when he was like a adolescent. You're dumb and was beating him and just abusing him. Yeah. And it, it's doubtful to say Elon Musk is dumb, right? Yeah, or, or those right, things right. that his father tried to place on him, and yeah. yet in that brokenness, mm-hmm. he's stronger. And yes. I think even from Rabbi, when he yeah. talks about his relationship with his daughter in helping her with her education, it's you're stronger there. Yeah, even though that yeah, hurt, yeah. it made you yeah. stronger on the other side. Yeah. So I think all things work together for good. Right? Yeah. God's going to use it still for good. And this is what I told my wife, because my wife in the younger, earlier ages would try to be, of course, that mom that's trying to bond with her daughter. But there's a certain age when a woman is, when a young girl is becoming a woman, that she even pushes back her own mother. True. Because it's like, don't treat me like a child anymore. And so I said, babe, let me Mm -hmm. handle it in this season. Mm -hmm. Let me be the one to help her with these things. I even will change my schedule as a pastor to help be home for tutoring Mm -hmm. in this new season because I realize she really needs me right now. Daughters need their dad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So do sons, of course. For sure. But sons usually end up having a stronger bond earlier on mm-hmm. because it's kind of like at some point, mo- the boys can't be mama's boys for the rest of their life. They need all. to bond with their fathers. But sometimes it's harder to bridge the gap from a daughter who's trying to bridge with their dad. Mm-hmm. It's like the dad has to be the one to take the entrance interest to take those daddy daughter dates and times with their daughter to to, pursuing her to to be the model to that young girl that when she picks a man to be with one day she's going to pick Mm -hmm. someone who honored and loved and cared for her like her father Mm -hmm. i I think that a mother and and i might get in trouble for saying this but it's just a generalization mm -hmm. mothers are so key in the nurturing formation development of a young child yes and then yet as just like you said as a girl gets older and maybe it's because we you know, I don't know, we'll take them out to eat and spend money on them or whatever. But as a person, a young person goes into teens and even young adult, a father's role is so key. Like, it's not it over is. there. It's so vital in that season of even a young more. person. Even more. More so. Almost more than the mom, I think. Yes, I agree with you. I, totally I know it agree. sounds biased, but it's really true. I've, I've seen it with my, my sons. Mm-hmm. You know, I've seen it now as my daughter's coming into being a teen, how vital a father actually is. So it's like, your job's not done here. No. Yeah. You're fixing to kick into overdrive yeah. here. Yes, yes. Because I find that sometimes what happens with all the estrogen in the relationship <laughs> between mother and daughter, there seems to be like, you know, don't tell me what to do. Stop treating me like a child. And, you know, I'm grown now. No, you're not grown. You know, yeah. like, and so the mom yeah. is always trying to almost reduce the little girl, the young lady back into a little girl because they're afraid I only have a few more years with you and I'm going to lose you. The mom doesn't want to lose them. The exactly mom right. doesn't want to lose them. Mm-hmm. But you have to let go. You do. Yeah. Like the eagle that's willing to allow the eaglet to, to be kicked out of the nest and 
fly or mm-hmm. do something. And that's, the, that's where the role of the father comes in because the Huge. father yes. has to empower yes. the child to, hey, get ready to fly. Give the child its, its stripes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then don't get wrong, you're not there to abandon it and let it no, fall and become no, a wreck. because they will swoop back in and rescue Precisely. them if, when needed. Yeah. But I think a father's role later in life is everything. I mean, it, it is. Just really, and it I, is. You know, my father passed away, but I even, as I became an adult, and then mm-hmm. my dad was an expert on all things. Yeah. You know, yeah. I just call him, on, I need help on this, a car, or this, relationships. And you, you, and it's, you reflect that. Mm-hmm. You're yeah. a, a bit of a jack of all trades. Yeah. And yeah. so it's true. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that's one of the that's things good. that you have to look at. Whatever your father's strength was, get as much out of that strength and don't hyper focus on their weaknesses. Mm-hmm. Really appreciate your father. When you're frustrated with your father, take a moment to appreciate, these are the things I did learn from my father. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if I didn't have him in my life, I wouldn't have learned those principles. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and when you look at the negative things, what I've learned uh, throughout the years, because I didn't know this in the beginning, because I would look at him like, you know, the negative side. But then I, I grew up and I, and I got, started getting to know my father and I realized, man, he, his childhood was pretty messed up. Yes. Like in Mexico. So his, he's a survivor. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, so compared to how his father treated him, he was an excellent father. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, uh, just shifting gears for a second. As a man, I think I would even speak this like with, and I've seen you, Rabbi, do it a lot, like being a father to some of the young people who don't have a father that's mm-hmm, present. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, how do you do that? What would be some of the things that you've mm-hmm. done? And I, and I have to say, like, when I look around, there's lots of young people. Um, they'll come to my house a lot, like uh, like um, Valerie Martinez. Her, her, mm-hmm. She comes up, her sons are there. Mm-hmm. And trying to step into a little bit of a role for young men and young women in that role of a father figure. Like, what does that look like? I know we have those that are biologically fully ours, but then there's others. And I yeah. think it's so important that, that good men step up yeah. to help, guide, direct, yeah. etc. You know what? I think in the beginning for me, it was more like, of course, everything I learned as far as the Bible, I wanted to pass that on. Mm. I realized it was not just being the intellectual Bible college instructor, teacher that is the role of the rabbi. I realized it was more like I'm here to help them develop the character that's deeply hidden inside them that just needs to come out because if they are a believer... It's Christ in you, the hope of glory, right? Mm-hmm. The Messiah lives in mm-hmm. you. So we just need to allow that to mature. As Paul was saying with Timothy and Titus, that Christ would be formed in you, that the Messiah would be formed in you, like the the character of Christ would be formed in you. And I think that's the thing this generation is lacking. They might have the knowledge. They've got the social media. They've got the YouTube videos, the DIY videos. They can do it all on their own. Mm-hmm. But what they can't get from videos is character building. Mm-hmm. And maturity yeah. and how to handle people. This is a perfect example. My nephew, Gio, who's now at Times Square Church in New York, you know, he was a youth director under Pastor Billy when he was a youth pastor for many years until he went to Louisiana, um, Our Savior's Church, um, and uh, under Pastor Jacob. And then he came back to California during the pandemic trying to find out what's my next move before he moved to New York. He was such a great role model to my daughter. Of course, they're cousins because it's my wife's sister's son. And she recently had to write for a school she's wanting to attend next year, um, Orange Lutheran. She had to write a kind of a paper on who mentored her, who she respects as, a, as a, someone that she wants to be like one day. And she used Geo as the example. And I was so impressed wow. with her writing because mm-hmm. she doesn't really care to write or read. It's not like her thing. She loves watching videos. She's a creative, you know. Mm-hmm. But when she was writing, she says one of the things she admired about Geo was the way he treated people, both student and parent, mm. and how he stayed integral through it all, meaning his character didn't waver. Well, Geo was also in my life group along with Pastor Billy and Pastor Andrew before they had the pastor titles. And, of course, Gio and his brother Jack that lived in my home. I raised him for 10 years like my own sons, like Abraham did a lot. And these boys became such great leaders, especially when I look at Gio and what my daughter wrote about him. One of the things she admired was he stayed consistent. Mm. And what she meant by that was what you see in church is also what you saw at home. Mm -hmm. To the point, if there was a situation that kind of blew up in the youth group, 
instead of like sharing all the dirty business and like kind of like creating seeds of gossip, he goes, well, I'm not, I'm not at liberty to talk about that, but just know it got handled or whatever. And we'd be like, come on, we're pastors. You can tell mm-hmm. us. No, you know, that confidentiality was so critical for him. Mm-hmm. No, that's between me and the student. He would even go, what I say, go over land and sea just to find one lost student that ran away from home yeah. and get him back to his parents in like the hood. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, it's crazy. And he would say, hey, I might be gone for quite a few hours. I'm going to go looking for this kid. And he'd bring him back home. So the hearts that he won of the parents mm-hmm. was huge. It was like a morning when he left Louisiana. It was like all the mm-hmm. kids were crying. All the parents were crying. My daughter was crying. So for her to write that about him, that shows that we can be an example and yeah, leaders to this sure. generation. And is he fatherless? Just to know a little. My, it's background. so funny. Gio never knew his father mm-hmm. until um, he was able to go to Puerto Rico at the very, like last, I think maybe a couple of years before he got married, he met his real dad. So you were sort of the father figure I to was him. the father figure to mm-hmm. him, probably the most consistent father figure to him. And, um, you know, and that's why there's always that special bond. But, you know, with both Jack and Gio. And again, I treat my sister-in-law like my sister. So of course her boys, they're, it's not my, my wife's nephews, they're my nephews, but really they're not just nephews, they're sons. Mm-hmm. And so I realized that he was a young kid who because he had the spiritual fathering from Pastor Obed, myself, and mm-hmm. other leaders like Pastor Billy, we all played a spiritual fathering role in Gio's life. He was able to father the next generation nice. and pass that right on. Mm-hmm. And he's still doing it to this day. In fact, he just, it, well, I can't announce this, but he's even getting a promotion where he's at right now at Times Square at Church because the spirit of excellence that he operates in That's and great. the integrity that my daughter was writing about is exactly what he's doing even in another state. That's amazing. So I'm just grateful that Destiny was able to be the the um the incubator for such great young men that mm-hmm. even if they didn't have fathers there's fathers in the that's house awesome. absolutely because why they're sons and daughters of the house mm-hmm. that need to yeah. be raised up that's beautiful that's excellent anything else you want to man we've went over we've, a lot we, like, I, honestly we, we could talk for hours we could go, come on we, we had some ribeye from the <laughs> rabbi and, Usually we try to keep it within a certain time range. And we're I was over thinking that. about that, but <laughs> you know, easily pass when it's two this hours, good, when it's this it good, good, how do you move on? We got to do another uh, we part definitely, two, yeah. part three. Hey, sure. I would love to invite both of you on the Dust the Rabbi podcast. So For maybe sure. we'll do, do some special episodes because I'm I'm really Still. wanting to um, tie in what we're doing with the journey with yeah. a lot of what's going on in the fruits of what we're seeing in our people. And I think you guys have played such a great role in that. And I'm just thinking. You know, it's important for listeners of podcasts like this mm-hmm. to get real help, mm-hmm. yeah. not just like trivia stuff they're hearing. And a lot of podcasts that are out there, they're not giving mm-hmm. the the listener what they really need. Mm-hmm. It's just something to tantalize, you know, and keep them listening, for but sure. not helping. Mm-hmm. And I love what you guys are doing, and I just think it's important that we really reach the heart of the Father. For sure. So we can communicate to the hearts of fathers. For sure. Yeah, know? and different different perspectives too. Uh last yeah. week we had Pastor Obed and and he yeah. mentioned he mentioned something that I I wouldn't do as a father. I, I think. I don't know. Maybe if what I was, was that throwing in, his son into the pool no, when he no, was <laughs> swim. <laughs> no, he mentioned <laughs> didn't hear about that one, but he mentioned going to Coachella Fest yeah, with his with he his did. with his daughter and son. Yeah. So I've never been in that situation. I told yeah. Ruby and, and she goes, Well I'm not interested, but I want Wonder uh, what I would course. do if yeah. she was interested in yeah. going to Coachella Fest. Yeah, so only because he wants to... to be able to help them learn how to decision make and help monitor or kind of be there to observe and to see and kind of watch his kids develop. Because a lot of kids nowadays, they think it's so cool, like, oh, let's go mm-hmm. to Coachella yeah. Fest. And it's sad that they go when there's other influences there that you got to be yeah. careful of. So I think he, that's his security blanket of saying, Maybe I could help monitor what really goes down, but I can. I, can, I get it. I get it. I totally it. get it. But I don't know if I would do it, but I would get it. Well, I, I, th- that's I, the whole that's point. That's where I'm at. That, yeah, that it's it's great that this podcast exists because yeah. people are going to hear different perspectives. Because yes. Pastor Obed is is a very respective, yeah. respected man in the yes, community. He's a absolutely. pillar in the community. He's a great father. Absolutely. So, so but everyone has of, their techniques. Instead sure. of yeah, without judging, instead right. of judging, wondering, okay, this is the perspective of a good. Good father, right? There's different ways. I mean, there's 
uh, many, what is it, skin a cat? What, is, what does it go? It's, uh, many ways to skin a cat. Yeah, and yeah. I would say this. One of the things I learned, especially with my son, Nathan, who now is 22, going to be married next week yeah. and pumped out, pumped, excited for that. But there was a season where, as a teenager, it was really difficult. And I'd read all kinds of books and seek out all kinds of advice yeah. from different everybody. Yeah. And I finally came to the conclusion is I would ask the Holy Spirit, because like, yes. I believe God will speak to you. He will. And I'd say, Holy Spirit, like, tell me what to do. And I would do that until he told me to do something else. Yeah. And so like, whether it's like, you know, whether it's Move. carrot or stick or whether it's this or it's that, or it's going to the Coachella Fest or not yeah. or whatever. To me, it's, we can give you principles to help you be a better yes. father. And yet along the way, I would hope every person truly would have a relationship with God to reach out to him and say, hey, tell me what I'm supposed to do in the season. Because yeah. I actually believe that God will help yes. you yes. Yeah. raise your child that. and have insight and wisdom specific to your situation. And at different seasons, they might not need different things. Yeah, It changes. And whatever's going to work for your individual kid, because every kid is different. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that was a gold bar, and that was one of many gold bars uh, uh, shared with us today. So, Rabbi... It's more like a gold mine, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. This I, podcast is a gold mine. Yes, it sure. is. I enjoy doing it. I think yeah. our voices as fathers need to be heard. Definitely. Yes. And my hope is that it would be a blessing to somebody that listens, whether now or a few years down the road. Absolutely. Can't wait for the next one. Rabbi, Absolutely. appreciate your time. Thank you so much, and yeah. uh, God bless you. God bless Shalom, God bless everyone. You all. Thank you.